Welcome back to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. It's time for Off the Press. We will take you through the pages of a national dailies and then have a big guest join us analyzing the stories. We do have on standby Chris Kende Wandu. It's good to have you join us this morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning. All right. As always, attention would be on the big stories on our dailies. I start off with the leadership newspaper this morning. I'd be looking at the bold caption. Governors disagree with President Muhammad Buhari, insist on state pleas. That's the bold caption. Says military pleas overwhelmed by security challenges. To upgrade vigilantes, local guards, Regional security outfit as interim measure. You also have ex-servicemen and security expert defer on state police. That argument has surfaced again. And I feel that would just constantly dominate, you know, the discourse until we decide whether or not we want, you know, state policing in our country. Federal government and marks 3.53 trillion investment to address 17 million housing deficit. That's also another caption on the leadership. And Tinubu's presidential ambition stares the internet. I mean, um, that has generated a lot of reactions. NLC, health workers knock bill to outlaw strike. That's also another interesting one this morning. And just before we move away, troops kill five terrorists in Kaduna village. After 10 years, Yobe lifts ban on motorcycles. You also have AFCON Super Eagles meet Pharaohs today, talking about uh, that game with Egypt. We'll see how that pans out. That's the much we can take on the leadership uh, newspaper this morning. Away from the leadership, let's turn our attention to the Punch newspaper. And on the Punch newspaper, the banner caption reads, Ohanese fumes alleges injustice as Tunubu declares presidential bid. I have informed Buhari of my ambition. He did not ask me to stop, says the APC leader. Tunubu's presidential ambition not rooted in equity. Justice, it's Igbo man's turn, or Haneze is quoted. P and I D firm paid 9,969 into director's daughter's accounts before agreements and signing. Wow. Uh, that's also another interesting caption. Uh, that's what a weakness is quoted to say. The value currency further raises interest rates, IMF tells Nigerians and others. EFCC rearrests MOFA uh, for alleged 32.9 billion naira money laundering, and discourse indebtedness hits 326 billion in nine months, says the federal government. And still looking at the punch newspaper this morning, power generation drops as vandals ground 504 megawatts planned. Plant, I take that again. Power generation drops as vandals ground 504 megawatt plant. Internet subscribers fall by 11 million over NIM and SIM, uh, that's the SIM linkages and orders. Uh, that's also another one you find this morning. And uh, parliamentary workers, Pickett National Assembly, protest on paid salaries and allowances. APC picks January 27th for a kitty governorship primaries. Kwanko so rubbishes zoning and begins consultation on 2023 presidential bid. Suspected courtists tie Lagos casino attendants' hands and stab victims to death. And you also have army arrest soldiers for alleged assault on your traffic workers, or Worthen, uh, Worthens, I beg your pardon. Ekiti sales boy disguised and threatened boss with kidnap and demands 1.5 million naira. And you also have the FRSC begins enforcement of speed limit and arrest seven motorists. Now, this is some of the headlines on the Punch newspaper. We move away from the Punch and let's all check out the Daily Independent newspaper this morning. 
2023 elections, I have confidence, capacity to rule Nigeria, says Tinubu. I have confidence, capacity to rule Nigeria, says Tinubu. Uh, that's the bold caption for the Daily Independent ahead of 2023. Says Buhari not adverse to his lifelong presidential plan. We have been vindicated by Tinubu's declaration. He should quit the stage for younger politicians. Uh, this is a lot of back and forth following this particular um, you know, caption. Gunmen enforcing sit-at-home order killed two and burned vehicles in Enugu and Anambra state. You also have subsidy removal will help 2022 budget implementation. This is according to civil society organization. Regime responsible for Nigerians' economic woes. Lassa fever killed doctor, two others in Benue state. And fiscal deficit funding, subsidies reform present risks to inflation. With bandits declared terrorists, we will defeat them. That's what the army chief is quoted to say. And fan arrest 90 persons at Lagos, Abuja airports over touting and extortion. Vice President Yemi Oshibanjo and Deputy Governors meet over boundary, boundary cries. Uh, this is some of the caption on the Daily Independent. And just before we move away, uh, we just also check out the Daily Sun newspaper this morning. And on the Daily Sun, still dominating all of the papers this morning. 2023, Tinubu notifies Buhari of presidential ambition. Uh, that's also on the board caption. Afeni Ferre, Ohaneze, ACF, MBF, orders divided. 57 groups endorse Vice President Yemi Osibanjo. Only PDP can rescue Nigeria. Governor Diri is quoted on that. And Bishop Koka denies DSS invitation. There's also another caption here. EFCC grills 22 suspected oil thieves and recovers 1.52 billion naira, 30, 386 million dollars in 2021. NLC attacks NAS over bill to outlaw industrial action. Nigerians want state police and Clark tells Buhari, accuses president of using police to obstruct free speech and persecute political enemies. Social media. Abia governor wants falsehood peddlers. Uh, it's also another one. And gunmen abduct Imo ex speaker for others. Akeri Dolu sets up campaign against beef in Southwest, Southwest and urges people to embrace poultry instead. IPOP explains proposed cow meat ban in Southeast. Uh, these are the headlines on the Daily Sun newspaper, uh, which is going to have. Chris Wendu joined the conversation this morning. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning once again. Good morning. So, so let's start off with the big stories on the dailies this morning and uh, the bold caption talking about the declaration for the presidential beat uh, 2023, talking about the former governor of Lagos State, Tunubu. Bola met Tunubu. What are your thoughts and the reactions that this has generated over, you know, the last 24 hours? Yes, the question we need to ask ourselves is, um, does the uh, former governor of uh, Lagos State, uh, national leader of APC, have the constitutional right to uh, lie for the uh, highest office in Nigeria? Of course it does. And uh, that is not, it is his right as enshrined by the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And, and that, that Constitution has given guidelines as to who um, can, can aspire to the uh, highest office in the land, age, education, and uh, other issues. Um, so if we be able to meet that requirement, then there is no problem with that. Don't forget, uh, it has been within the realms of rumors for months now uh, whether or not uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu is going to run uh, in 2023, and that there's so many uh, permission here and there 
But finally, he, yesterday, he showed up at Asoro and they met with the president and he told us that he has formally informed the president of his desire to occupy the office in 2023 and, um, and uh, take over office uh, from the president. And um, so I have no problem with that. Uh, but it is now within the uh, party itself to be able to determine who is going to fly their uh, flag. Uh, what he did not tell us uh, fully yesterday was the reaction of the president. Also, he said the president has nothing against him. But I, would have, um, I wanted to see whether the president was going to uh, endorse him. But he did tell us that. Don't also forget that the president, a few days ago, in a television interview, said that he has his own candidate for 2023, that he was not going to name the person because he feels that if he names him, uh, there is the possibility that he will name it. But good enough, uh, Tinubu has thrown his heart in the ring. And uh, I can assure you that in the next few days or weeks, some other people within the political party also will also express their own uh, ambition. And I will take it from there. But what is more paramount now is how APC will be able to put his heart together and hold this national convention, which it has postponed several um, There are so many uh, talk here and there on the reason why that convention is not holding. But from what we're hearing, that I think in the next few weeks, they'll be able to do that. But whether or not Tungo has the right to contest, fine. But my own little challenge there is that I, I feel that, one, that um, he might have one or two things against him. One is the fact that he... Tinubu is not, uh, although I'm not a medical doctor, but I know that uh, Tinubu has been in and out of hospital for some time now. I don't know how that is going to count against him uh, because um, we also saw what happened in 2015 when we had a president that was elected that was going in and out of hospital almost on a monthly basis, and that in itself affected his capacity and performance as a president for a long time. There was a time he was in the UK for months, or weeks, and uh, they continue going in, and uh, that for me uh, was a, a minus for the president. And we know that um, uh, former Governor uh, Paula Tinubu has not been the best of health, but it's only God that gives health, so nobody can say it. So if his stick is really fit now, all well and good. Second is also the issue of age. Um, Paula uh, Ahmed Tinubu is in the 70s, going to the 80s. Do we still need? So there are such old people to be able to um, handle the affairs of the country. Do they have the capacity and mental um, uh, ability to be able to handle issues of governance in a polarized uh, system like ours? That is left to be seen. But as I said, he has the right to contest and he has made this decision. So he says he's consulting and informally he will inform Nigeria in the days to come, formally. Okay, so um, within the particular premise now. Let's also talk about the fact that you also have some groups uh, like the Ohanese among others who are saying that this is actually not very fair uh, because it should be uh, the time for the South. Now when you talk about the South, we don't know if we're talking about the Southeast or the Southwest. Uh, that's the issue of zoning. So what are your thoughts surrounding these uh, arguments that are being put out now? It should be, you know, the turn for the South. Well, nobody will drop uh, the, any office on your laps. You have to work for it. So if the Southeast wants the presidency, then they have to work for it. They have to consult with other stakeholders across Nigeria, not just only in the South, but also in the North, and win their confidence. It also depends on the kind of candidate they are bringing forward. Will they be able to match other candidates from other parts of the country? That is also so for them to be able to do that, they also have to put their hearts together. And other work are they talking about? If we, we let us be realistic, it, the Southeast has never had, uh, have not had the best of time with APC. They both supported the APC uh, as, a, as a party. Um, South is mostly a, a PDP. Um, um, <laughs> region, right from 1999, and they've not shifted that. Although you have pockets of um, governors coming from the APC once in a while, you have Richard Sokrocha, uh, that was a governor of Imo State, before the um, Hope Yuzo um, was installed by the um, Supreme Court, um, who is also the governor of the uh, of Imo State presently. In the South East, you have an Afghan governor in Anambra State. Then, in the other parts of the 
uh, state also. You have Eboyi, which is which is um, predominantly used to be a PDP state, but the governor uh, defected from the PDP to the APC. But uh, most often than not, we always know that the Southeast has always been pro PDP. Uh, if they're saying that Tinubu is doing the wrong thing by not allowing the um, uh, South, South Easterners to go for, uh, have a shot at the president, when that is wrong. They have equal candidates in the APC who can also give Balas Tinubu a rock for his money. At the, uh, uh, at the convention, if they so wish, so you have the Ngige there, you have so many of the, you have Kostas of Koracha, you have so many members of the um, uh, uh, South Easterners in the APC. If they treat that as their right, then let them go to convention and also contest alongside with uh, Bolatinubu and other uh, presidential aspirants of the APC. And and uh, let's see how it goes. But if you think that they can just sit down and be saying that give us the presidency for 2020, nobody's going to do that. Politics is about giving and taking. So you give and take. So you. But uh, don't forget that also the PDP has not only its own uh, presidential uh, uh, seat to any region yet. So that's what I say. It's probably, the probably my season into the south or southeast has to be. But um, if what is coming out of the PDP is anything to go by, if you look at one of the headlines this morning, former Kanu State Governor Rabbi Wakwanso said that PDP must not zone his presidential um, slot to the south, that you should leave it open. And if that's the kind of information and mindset that is coming from the north, then uh, there's a lot of challenges there. But as I said, Southeast should put their ass together, work together, and be able to come up with credible candidates that can face anybody from any part of the country. And that will be left for Nigeria to have food for a candidate of their choice. All right, let's also look at the leadership. On the leadership, uh, you have the NLC and health workers knock Bill to outlaw strike. Uh, that seemed, uh, you know, very, a little bit undemocratic. Uh, because strike has always been, you know, means where uh, different persons have actually deployed a tool to demand, you know, their needs, I mean, policies and demand good governance and, uh, you know, push their own consents uh, to government across board. There's nobody that can stop anybody from going on strike. There is that a constitutional right. Uh, if there is anything that agitates your mind, that you think that your rights are being Stubborn of all, or you are not getting the necessary um, uh, remuneration as, uh, as agreed, then you have a right to go on strike. There is no body, there is no court in the land that can stop anybody from going on strike. So if anybody is making that allusion that people should go on strike and just wasting his time, they will surely go on strike. That is the only way that they can press for the for demands and demands on issues concerning them, especially when it comes to welfare of workers. That is only legitimate way of agitation, except you now want them to resort to violence, which is against um, normal norms and also the constitution. Uh, so, but that will stop everybody from going on strike. That is not a good. The constitution is very, very clear on this. And um, there have been so many judge, judgment and court pronouncements on those issues. And um, that's the fundamental right of every worker. And um, so uh, that is not even a, a, a <laughs> something to discuss about. There is no good way about it. Every worker has a right to go on strike. No, but, but, you know, the, the, we're talking about, you know, an act of legislation here that's almost, you know, seeing the light of day. And what if that becomes a law that, you know, strike should be outlawed? Yes. Don't forget that before people, anybody in Jesus of that, or before any organization or group, uh, go on strike. There have always been negotiation. Strike is always the last point um, where, at which workers work uh, begins disobedience. Don't forget there will always be room for negotiations and renegotiations and negotiation and the rest of them. It is only when that fails that strike begins. Nobody comes up, No, I have never seen a little labor organization or any organization that comes up and just say, we are going on strike. No, it is not done. What normally happens is that there will be negotiation. After negotiation must have broken down, then there will be notices. They give notices in the next three weeks, in the next one month, in the next two months. If you don't meet our demands, address of them, we go on strike. So, and that is the normal. That is normal way it goes. 
So, uh, whether legislation or not, as I repeat and I continue to say, there is no law that stops any person, that stops any worker from going on strike in Nigeria. None. There is none. So, the, only, the best way to go about it, and how, why do people go on strike? Is because most often they are not organizations and government agencies or government goes into negotiation, goes into agreement with workers, sign a, a document, sign a contract, and at the end of things, what well, they fail. It has happened several times over and over again. Yeah, we see it with ASU, we see it uh, NMA, we see it with uh, local government workers, we see it with judiciary workers, and the rest of them. At the end of it, all, the, the government or some of these. Uh, uh, organizations don't meet up to the contract, the terms of the contract, and that is what leads to um, such a strike. So, uh, but if you don't want such, then you have to meet the demands of the um, of the workers. Else, as I said, strike is always the last option. All right, and you also uh, like to share your thoughts on the seated home order that's been enforced in, you know, Enugu and Anambra State, and the argument surrounding it. And some people say it has not yielded any result for the IPOP, and so a different approach should be taken, however, to press forth their demands. Uh, iPod, 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 every time. <laughs> The issue with uh, the issue is up with iPod is uh, it's multi uh, functional um, as it were. Now, I think the most critical point in question is now is whether or not to, uh, the issue surrounding the continued detention of Nambika. Several people from the south east have felt that uh, there's a need for the for the government to just let go, and so that there'll be a need for proper negotiation on some of the issues raised by Nam De Carlo and IPO. Uh, don't forget recently that in an interview uh, a few days ago, the president came out to say that there is nothing he's going to do about Nam De Carlo, that Nam De Carlo is going to go through the means of um, prosecution and he should be able to defend himself in court. That, he, that is off his um, table now, that Nam De Carlo. But I know that um, so many leaders of the Southeast and also uh, Hannes and Digo have come out to say that um, that, is need, that is not the way to go, that the president should have a routine. Don't, uh, don't forget also some months back, leaders, of, um, leaders from the Southeast met with the president at the villa, um, leading that he should be able to handle the issue of Nam Kalu with some kind of uh, fatherly, play some fatherly role and see whether he can be released. But, the, on a very on a daily basis, the the, the, the iPod in itself is digging in, and um, of recent, if you uh, the statement coming from iPod is anything to come by, uh, iPod is saying by the, by April uh, that they will ban all beef or cows, uh, eating of um, beef or cow meat in the southeast. That uh, they will stop uh, movement of cow, uh, cows into the southeast. So other groups have also come out to say that if that happened, then also they are going to place ban on goods coming from the south east into the north. This, to me, is not the way to go. Uh, we, we should be looking for solutions to the problems as it's fair. And what we are seeing now is an escalation of crisis, both from the IPOB and some other groups. This is not the way to go. I think that we can still have a more a robust approach to the issues uh, as they, yes, the question you always ask, I've always said is that, in you know, as much as I don't believe in iPod or whatever I'm just to say, but most of them know we cannot throw away the baby with the uh, with the uh, bad water. Most of the issues raised by uh, Nam De Carlo is it is some of this issue is it true and it's true because we are talking of uh, marginalization. Don't forget, some few minutes ago we are talking about the start is saying that they deserve the presidency in 2023 and they believe that other parts of the country should support them. That is part of what they feel that they have been marginalized. Because come to think of it, since 1999, the South is the only region that have not produced the presidency. It's not a produced uh, president, uh, have produced president uh, in the person of Yaragua. The South has produced Molushego um, um, and Basanjo. The South has, South South has produced um, good Lord Jonathan, but nothing, uh, nobody from the South is. So some of these are the key uh, uh, allegations being made by agitators from the South East, and um, I think that should be looked at instead of just sweeping it under the carpet. But I think that uh, we were the, best to, the best way to go about it is for us to have a Georgia uh, 
discussion on issues of agitation, not only in the South, but even in the Southwest, don't forget the Bohos and the rest of them are also agitating. And them. So we have so much on our table now that any level of distraction will, be not, will not be good for the Nigeria. What we need now is a united force to force to fight the problem we are having, which is the problem of insecurity. All hands must be on deck, whether from the north, from the south, or from anywhere, to make sure we are able to cut this uh, and be able to kill this terrible uh, issue of insecurity that is practically taking over Nigeria. That, to me, should be a priority. All of that level of things should go into the realms of negotiation, and I think we can get it right if we have the, uh, the best of will to do that. All right, so I'd also like to draw your attention to another, you know, caption here on the Daily Independent. He says that subsidy removal will help 2022 budget implementation. This is according to civil society organization. Do you agree with that uh, ideology? Anybody can come up to him and say he's a civil uh, society organization, all sorts of the Jankara uh, the civil society. I don't know the name, I don't read the story, so I don't know which of them. Everybody wake up one day and say, I'm a civil society and the rest of them. Forget this people. Um, they are just talking for the face of talk. We have been given so many reasons why, how removal of subsidy uh, can, uh, can help the economy. Fine. I am for removal of subsidy, but the fact is that at the end of it all, what comes out of it? What other will we be able to be able to make we're able to make? Are we going to channel it truly, as the federal government has always told us, into capital projects and projects that will benefit Nigerians? That itself has been, always been the issue. And if you say you are removing subsidy, then what is the alternative? We are talking of now Nigerians are going to buy petroleum at 300 and something. Don't forget that this is Nigeria that already be overtaxed. Even recently, just as a few days ago, when the Minister of Finance was talking about the issue of that, the soft drinks that you are 19, there's going to be tax on more tax on it. I'm sure you are aware of that. They just came up with that. They, they, they call it the carbonate drinks. That's going to be taxed. We have moved back from 5% to 7.5%. On a daily basis, the bank are charging us, uh, charging, uh, charging us. There are so many other taxes across like this. So, a removal of subsidy. I have, we've said it time and time on. It's not the removal of subsidy uh, on petroleum that is the problem. We find that the, the fact is that we have to make a refinery to work. We must stop the importation of fuel. No matter whatever you see, if you remove subsidy, the problem will continue in as much as we continue to import fuel. The prices of this product will continue to go. As so the promises made to Nigerians in 2015 by this current government, this outgoing, I call it the outgoing government because they're practically dead had about seven years and just have barely one year to go, it is that they are going to revive and build so many refineries that so the end of the future will not be importing fuel. But what we, over 95%, if not 100% of the fuel that we consume and petrol we consume in Nigeria are uh, imported. And that is the reason why we have these high prices. We, it is only Nigeria that is a country that produces crude oil, exports crude oil, and now buy petroleum. No other country in the world, even within OPEC, does that. And that is where the problem is. So if you continue to say, oh, we want to remove uh, um, uh, subsidy on petroleum, we are going to channel this thing into uh, other sectors and rest of them. I don't believe that. I don't believe in that analogy. Because even if you remove subsidy tomorrow, they will still come up with something. So, but I don't, so for me, forget all these uh, wannabe civil societies or whatever they call them. I don't think they have the best interest of Nigeria. They should be telling us the alternative for Ross. They should be telling us what we should do. They should be telling the government what to do. And not just adding um, uh, adding to the talk and saying that uh, we need to remove so, As if we remove, remove subsidy, that is the end of the problem. That is not the end of the problem. All right. On the punch, you also have devalue currency further, raise interest rates. IMF tells Nigeria and others. Well... We are always on the back account of IMF and the World Bank. They determine what happens in the economy and the rest of it. But why we are always having so much, uh, uh, what I would, I, I would say that, so much show, and uh, we cannot be able to arrest the issue of um, the, the, the devaluation and the proper problem we are having with uh, the dollar to Naira is because we are not exporting more. We are a dependent, import-dependent country. And when you continue to depend on importation, that is what happens. 
you cannot have a control over your own currency because if you are exporting more, if you are exporting enough, then you also will be making foreign exchange. That in itself will bring down um, uh, the capacity of your own bet as of uh, as of a few days ago uh, in the Euro market. The dollar is going for over 550, uh, 550 naira to a dollar. That is on the high side. Uh, the official market is about 400 and something. But how many people have the opportunity of it? What we need to do is to create enough avenue for exporting. We should create, be more creative in, in, in our economy. We have talked about the issue of agriculture. We have talked about the issue of mining. These are other sectors, where, even IT. Most countries live on IT. There is a, they, they, that's what they, that's the, what they live on. A country like India, a country like China, I still do think that we can do a lot in that. But once we continue, continue importing and importing and importing, that is going to be the problem. And it will continue to have a condition on, uh, on our currency. And don't forget that we practically turn to a growing country. On a daily basis, we are going to China and across the globe to borrow money. And that is not the way to go. If you continue, a country that goes, any person that goes to borrow goes and sorrow you. So we are the beck and call of some of these countries that we practically go to on our knees every day begging for money. Instead of looking for ways of, I believe and I still think that this government has the capacity, we have enough Nigerians that can have the capacity to think out of the bus and be able to revive this country, turn around this economy. But we play politics with everything. It don't, they don't have to come from the APC. Obasanjo did it in 1999 by bringing so many technocrats. Somebody like Okonjo Iwana, uh, uh, OBA, uh, as a uh, people like Erufai, who was in charge of BP. We are not members of PDP. They just came, they are technocrats, which were brought into government. And you saw what they did. By the time the government of Obasanjo was leaving, we have practically paid up all our foreign debts. And we had nothing. But what have we been having now? We just have yes man and party men being appointed. We don't know they are left on their right. And the economy is continuing to lose dive as we are having it. Well, but um, what would be the implication if, you know, we have to pay attention to the advice of the MIF, I mean, the uh, International Monetary Fund, that's the IMF right now. And you also mentioned the fact that uh, we are constantly at the mercy of the International Monetary Fund. Now, what's that? It's not today that I may have been telling us this. Don't forget that in uh, years back, remember when the days of SAP, uh, if you remember the day of structural adjustment program in those days, it was an IMF policy. IMS will always go to developing countries and be able to give all sorts of um, uh, monetary advices. IMF cannot open its mouth and tell Russia or United States of America what to do. Because these are strong economies. They cannot. They cannot go to France. They cannot go to Germany. I tell them what to, they cannot tell China what to do. It's only developing countries like ours that are dependent, that are bigger nations, that I remember we always did, that we must always find a homegrown solution to our economic problems and not what IMF or World Bank tells us. That is my that is what I'm saying. We must find a homegrown problem solution to our problem. We cannot be waiting on IMF on a, on a daily basis to tell us what to do. Are we saying that? Don't forget that you are talking of IMF or World Bank. In Nigeria, was the former president um, 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 this thing of um, uh, World Bank. Don't forget that Ngozi um, um, well at once was in the World Bank and the end of World Bank. Um, um, our own, uh, 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 um, uh, um, what's her name? Uh, I just got her name now, was also at the World Bank as the vice president at one point, Bobby is a facility. The fact I'm trying to say is that until we continue going this route of always depending on foreign loans, on foreign debt, and not um, building enough capacity economically in Nigeria to be able to empower ourselves and be able to handle ourselves, they will continue to, because they know you always come around to borrow from IMF, they know you come to borrow from World Bank. And when you go borrowing, they are going to give you the tax. It's just like asking for a bank loan. If you go to the bank to borrow money, you'll be asked not only collateral, but the bank also wants to tell you what to do with the money you are borrowing. So that is the problem we are having. So IMF will always come, and World Bank will always come to tell us what about are those monetary policies, physical or whatever policies, are they good enough for the country? Has it good enough for Nigeria? Has it worked for us? It has not worked. So what we need to do is build up our capacity, look at our economy, transform our economy, make ourselves 
we put ourselves in a position where we don't need to wait for anybody to tell us what to do. But if we continue to wait on them, depend on the IMF and walk back for our survivor, whatever they give us, we have no option than to take it. Oh, well, uh, thank you so much, Chris Wandu, for being part of the conversation this morning. Uh, we really do appreciate your time and your thoughts on these issues. We look forward to having uh, more of you. Thank you very much for having me. I do have a nice day. All right, you too. Well, that's the much we can take on Off the Press this morning. When we come through, we will head straight to our first major conversation where we will be looking at the cyber attack on the National Identity Management Commission that has cost, allegedly cost over 3 million national identity cards of Nigerians. Please stick around. <laughs>